Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Shireen Bhan. A lot of you write into us saying you envy what we do, you envy our jobs because it's a lot of fun to be driving around in fast cars and fast bikes in some of the world's most exotic locations. It is a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of back-breaking hard work. We're vulnerable to the vagaries of the weather, the vagaries of technology, insane pressure and deadlines. So it isn't as easy as it looks. So we decided to send Jamshed out on a very critical assignment and let's take a look at everything that he had to go through to put this together for you. Every once in a while, you find yourself facing a day of massive importance in your professional career. You can barely sleep the night before in anticipation and fear. Now, today was one such day for me, a Monday I spent the entire weekend preparing for. It involved driving these cars all the way to Mahableshwar in search for the best strawberry and cream in the world. Right, for an extraordinary mission like mine, you need extraordinary machines. If luck favours you, you can have two of them. If fortune smiles, three. But you need to be blessed if the armada is made of four. Four sub five second cars to a hundred that is. Now these cars are quite different. On one hand, you have these luxury flagship saloons from Mercedes and BMW, which have been handed over to the evil doctors at their respective performance divisions, who have then transformed them into disguised monsters. But these are still cars you can take to work every day, indulge your family of five in utter luxury, and yet get supercar-like performance when you want it. Then if you don't mind the lack of space or a stiffer ride or a bit more impracticality, you have these coupes for people who want the looks to match the performance. There's nothing understated about them. Low slung, sloping roof line and a lifetime guarantee of passionate glances and lustful looks. But the one common denominator all these cars have is that they're all very, very fast. My journey begins in the Audi RS5, which is loosely based on the Audi A5. But apart from the roof and the doors, the RS5 has little to do with its donor. The large grille and the air dams on the fascia, the low ride height and the pop-up rear wing give the RS5 a whole different sporty character. However, the engine is a bit overshadowed by the company it's in. The RS5 V8 is the only naturally aspirated engine of this lot. It's essentially Audi's V10 with two cylinders sliced off. And contrary to what you might think, this has little to do with the S5 V8. Now, of this lot, probably has the least impressive figures. You have 444 brake horsepower and about 430 newton meters of max torque only but this is also the only car to get an all-wheel drive system Audi Squattro system no less and this will propel it faster off the line the Quattro system sends 60% of the power to the rear wheels but as it detects understeer this percentage rises to 85 an electronically controlled differential does the job of a mechanical limited slip diff and all four wheels get the torque vectoring system which seems to be a newfound marvel on a lot of modern day sports cars. The RS5 has 58% of its weight biased towards the front and with the all wheel drive system you would expect it to understeer a bit. And you wouldn't be wrong, especially when you've overcooked a corner on the gas. But the Quattro's torque vectoring system manages to keep you in control just fine. All in all, the Audi has German standards of handling precision. There's lots of grip from these 30 profile tyres and on a track, the RS5 will definitely give the rest a run for their money. But it does have a tendency to tramline excessively under hard braking and over undulations despite the Quattro's brilliant electronics. And this can catch you off guard at times. Both the RS5 and the XKRS are not four-seaters. Now they have these things at the back that look like seats, but they're not. Well, at least you can't use them. To me, both these cars are two-door, 
two-seater coupes. Not that I've had enough of the Audi yet, but it is time however to change my ride and get into the AMG. Now this is the newest car of this slot having been under the knife most recently. This latest generation of the E63 saw a huge change of heart which left a lot of fans of the Mercedes-Benz performance tuning shop quite skeptical. The mammoth 6.2 litre naturally aspirated V8 has now been replaced by a 5.5 litre twin turbo. Now this is still the largest engine of this lot. So this move kind of left a lot of AMG fans divided. But it's actually when you drive this car that you realise that change is good. Not only is the downsize engine much more fuel efficient and eco-friendly over the previous generation, the addition of the twin turbos has increased the power and performance. The AMG is jointly quickest to 100 of this pack at 4.2 seconds. Of course, this performance does come at a price as the AMG guzzles the most fuel of this lot too. And on a long drive like this, the puny 66 litre fuel tank doesn't help either. So has the change of engine philosophy marred the driving pleasure of the AMG? Not a chance. AMG is known to make beautiful music with mechanicals. I'm surprised they haven't been nominated to the Grammys yet. And despite the transformation of the E63, it just manages to sound sublime. If the steering doesn't give you enough response, just the sound of the engine gives you a feel of the speed. You take away the sound from this engine and the E63 just feels ordinary despite the performance. Okay, now let me not get too comfortable in this AMG because I have two more awe-inspiring machines to introduce you to. But first, a small break. If you've just tuned in, I've embarked on a trip to Mahableshwar in four spectacular cars and so far you've missed a ride with me in the Audi RS5 and the Mercedes E63 AMG. But it is now time for me to introduce you to our third contender for this epic journey, Mavarin Motorworks' spunky M5. The year was 1985 and BMW decided to hand over its sober and lavish 5 Series saloon to the devious M department. And what they created was the then fastest production saloon in the world. Since then, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde metaphor has been used more for the BMW M5 than any other car. But Mr. Hyde seems to have gone into hiding now. On paper, this is a smaller engine when compared to the AMG's mighty 5.5-litre twin-turbo. But this does make more horsepower than the rest of the pack. But the fact of the matter is that the power just comes a tad bit late. Till you're at about 3,000 RPM, this just doesn't feel like an M. It doesn't even sound that special. On the brighter side, this gearbox is absolutely brilliant. It's fast, it's crisp, it's precise. One thing that might irk you though is the lack of the parking button on the gear stick. So until you consult the user manual, you might find yourself struggling just like I did. Apart from that little niggle, the interfacing with the rest of the car's dynamic setup and the infotainment system is wonderfully easy and user-friendly. The extent to which you can customize the driving modes is fantastic. You can choose individual settings for the gearbox response, steering system and the suspension. And that's not all that will give you a bit of peace of mind. On a day when none of the cars even made it from Bombay to Mahableshwar on a full tank, you realize the value of a large fuel tank. The BMW has the largest tank of the lot at 80 litres and it's the most fuel efficient as well. The M5 comes with BMW's customary run flat tyres. I would have gotten into my usual barrage of criticism. But then just maybe, run flats do make sense on an M5. Now think about it. Somebody who spent 1.3 crores on this car isn't going to mind spending a couple of tens of thousands 
for a replacement tyre, but might just mind getting down and changing the tyre himself. And if he's driving an M5, I doubt he has a chauffeur to do it for him. And the more you keep driving the M5, the more it seems to grow on you. The way everything about this car, the feedback, the engine response, the electronics, all working together to give you control as opposed to being this strict school teacher. Now it just doesn't get any better than this. Or does it? Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the life of this party. It's loud, it's brash and it's unabashedly evocative. Jaguar's feisty XKRS. The XKRS is by far the scariest car to drive off the lot Ergo, the most fun to drive off the lot. Now, this thing is bordering on savage. It power slides in a straight line in third gear. If you think my hand movements on this straight road is a play in the steering wheel, well, it's not. That's me frantically trying to counter these unwanted twitches. Even with all the electronics and safety features working overtime, this car is a handful for even the most accomplished drivers. You simply cannot take it for granted or it will kill you. And then, there's a sound it makes. You don't need a tunnel, you don't need to roll down your windows. All you need to do is throw the throttle and you can hear this thing a mile away. It will scare the living daylights out of people on the road. But I do have a tunnel coming up ahead and I am going to roll down my windows. In the AMG you get this ballad of rev match downshift. In this, it feels like a small battle between nations. If the AMG is a symphony, this is death metal. Days such as these are the rewarding days of motoring journalism. These four cars have been an absolute delight. Driving each of them actually spoiled me to the extent that I found myself being critical of them at times. When on another day, with any one of them, I'd just be delving in superlatives throughout my story. I just can't wait to get these cars on a racetrack, and I promise you I will, because that's where I think they'd be in their best element. But for now, the drive back to Bombay should suffice. And I also managed to accomplish what I'd set out to do. What an epic day it's been. It's also been a day of some extraordinary numbers. Four cars worth five and a half crore rupees. 2,100 brake horsepower and fuel worth 50,000 rupees. Well, I finally found my strawberry and cream and after this, there's 250 more kilometers of pure driving salvation. Oh, and by the way, how was your Monday?